sex talk. Derek and Miley. Cause sexuality is tough. And okay, sex just isn't good enough. No. Sex talk. With Derek and Miley. Hey, folks. Welcome to Sex Talk with Erica Miley. Erica Miley here. Y'all, we're going to get into it today. I know I tell you that a lot, but you, know, you should know by now that the actual nerd that you're dealing with every time that you <laughs> press play on this podcast, we're going to talk all things polyamorous, ambiamorous, all of the relationship structures today. Kira Joel is an ambiamorous, bisexual, kinky author and narrator. She has supported local BDSM groups. And why she is here is to talk openly about the struggles and triumphs of her life and how she loves. You know, Kira, thanks for being here. I was just so Thank tickled. For having me. Thanks. Uh, TikTok strikes again. It it <laughs> it, gives, it gives us this incredible place to like find find each other but also like peek into each other's lives and I just was so struck by your openness and so I'm just I'm just so glad that you're here thank you for being on the show yeah thanks I'm excited so one of the things that you've talked about is your in in the socials in the TikTok land is how you navigate your relationships and sex and but also having been raised in a strict Christian household, there's a lot of shame you've expressed. And I, I kind of want to, I want you to talk about how that shaped you and your openness to the world on social media. It took a lot of work because uh-huh. I, yeah, had all that shame. And when I was younger, before puberty hit, I mm. didn't understand why people would have sex before marriage. I was like, you're not supposed to. You want to make God happy. I would never, ever, ever. And then puberty hit. And suddenly it was like a crisis. (laughs) I was thinking, oh no, I have all of these feelings, but I'm not supposed to. And so the shame was horrible. And just being a young teenager and exploring, but knowing Mm -hmm. every single time that it was wrong. And I mean, it probably over a decade to get comfortable or longer with my sexuality and there's still little pings that will come up oh, yeah. because you know I have multiple partners and that can yeah. be kind of weird or if I'm with two in the same day I'll just be like am I a hoe <laughs> like, <laughs> a bad singer? and it's way better than it was but there still are those moments where I kind of think about that yeah. like oh well, that's not great that old nasty narrative like you just pointed out something though that I think is we we have to talk about that that i i remember clearly i shared with you before i started recording and the listeners are pretty familiar i was raised in an evangelical household and it you that shift that you talked about i was like oh i remember that so well the oh yeah i totally buy into why why would you want to have sex before marriage and then puberty happens and you're like yeah. whoa <laughs> Exactly. How, but but yeah. now I have all this stuff and I'm not supposed to want to like that. You said that so yeah. clearly, and I was just like, oh, oh, flash, flash right yeah. back to there. I totally get that. I think you're you're yeah. on to this, like this really kind of sticky place that we I mean, being teenagers is being a sticky human being generally, but like like this place that happens for so many of us that it just doesn't the the disconnect between what's happening in your body and what you're being told is so so um it's almost alarming as a child yeah yeah very much so when did you really start doing your work i i'm curious like you said it took you about 10 years like when did you really open up that door for yourself i don't remember if there was an exact moment that suddenly happened i think it was that I realized, well, I basically I went through deconstruction mm-hmm. because of it. And there were other things because of religion and Christianity being so anti LGBTQ plus and everything mm-hmm. that I, I just realized I, I can't do this anymore. I can't have so much shame around this. And there's so many things that don't make sense, yeah. but then I missed God and I mm-hmm. realized, well, you can actually have a different, version of christianity 
where you yeah. don't have to be all in of this fear. You can have more, I call it love based and yes. just view God as you know grace and forgiving and loving. And that a lot of the stuff that people believe was either twisted or I don't really know what, honestly, but it was through that deconstructing and reconstructing that I was able to get more comfortable with my sexuality. Yeah, I think uh, you're describing something that I know I, I have I have friends, I have clients, I myself remember this this deconstruction and then the void and trying to understand mm -hmm. what could go there. You're, yeah. you're pointing to something that I think that when you're going through the process of deconstruction that I don't know that we talk about that, that feeling of the void. Mm -hmm. What do you think as far as like started when you started to understand um, relationships and love and sex could be after deconstruction? Like how did you dip your toe? How did you, how did you begin? I don't know if I even remember how I began. I think I was, it was when I was married, mm. I believe. Mm. And I was in a marriage that felt really lonely because my husband at the time would play video games practically 24 seven, like mm. up all night and play them pretty much during the day. That's when I learned about polyamory mm. because I was thinking, oh, I'm so lonely. Like, I wish I could just have another person and then I realized that's an option and there was still kind of guilt and shame around it and I also then started discovering like the kink world and that we had a local mm -hmm. scene and just started working through that and figuring out oh yeah this is a thing I can do I hear like you open the door and then the possibilities started to creep in right like I think, yeah I think you and then you start seeing that other people have gone through this right mm -hmm. like and i think yeah. that that's, once that's revealed that's harder that it's it's very very hard to go back because you're just like oh but mm -hmm. there's this world out here <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> so i i do want to get to the basics for the listeners Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask, like, you and I talked about it, I, was, I have, like, the three rapid-fire questions here because I think they're all really interconnected, so I want to talk about them. Yeah. Like, what is poly? What is being ambiamorous? And how are they interconnected and or different? So poly, I've always understood, means multiple loves. And so mm -hmm. you have multiple loving relationships. So it's a branch of ethical non-monogamy. But it's usually more around the idea of you know loving relationships versus just banging whoever. Right. Uh, and then for ambiamory, it's kind of being between monogamous and polyamorous. Mm -hmm. So I can be happy in either situation. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I identify. And I feel like they're similar. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, you can be in a polyamorous relationship and be ambiamorous. Mm-hmm. I, I like that you've that you've laid the map for there being a spectrum of options here. There is a spectrum yeah. of options that yeah, exactly. I do think when you're exploring an identity, what no matter what that identity is, no matter what or who you or genitals you're attracted to, like that when you're trying to figure that out, you really want yourself to fit in a box, right? Like you want there to be a definitive yeah. answer. And then you start walking yeah. on this path and you're like, oh shit. <laughs> there isn't really like a definitive answer. Shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm kind of hearing that in like the undercurrent of what you're talking about. This, this, mm -hmm. oh, there's this between place that we yeah. can be happy in either. Was, was there a relationship that kind of taught you that about yourself? you only have to share as much as you want I think just being in the one I'm in now and realizing I a little bit more geared towards the monogamous side mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's hard having a person that just sometimes isn't available you know sometimes he's off with his partner and if I have something come up I have to deal with it on my own mm. um so I was like oh I'd really like to have a person that's kind of more my 
but we still kind of have these other little relationships as well. Mm, okay. So it's like, it, it's like having maybe that primary stable relationship in addition to having other relationships. And maybe that other person might have a, another stable relationship as well. That yeah. you're fulfilling different needs and roles for people mm-hmm. or yeah. yourself or maybe even your own life. I, I I think you're you're on to something that uh, I don't know that many people realize that they if they're not doing they should be doing in their own lives that we should be having lots of relationships to meet our needs generally not just in our romantic mm-hmm. relationships not just in our sexual yeah. relationships we really do need friendships that are super intimate mm-hmm. we need different levels of intimacy with different people as community I think yeah I don't know what what is What do you think the influence of COVID has been on your understanding of how you need to love? I think it just shines a spotlight on how much we do need it because suddenly a lot of people are isolated and they Mm. don't get to have as much time with friends or other partners or things like that. And so just that lack of people, I think, has made it so obvious that we do need those connections and that intimacy yeah i think it's like i I keep uh i keep referring to covid as gasoline like (laughs) and the match maybe the gasoline and the match i feel like maybe that goes together (laughs) like you said a spotlight it is just you can't look away you can't look Uh away any longer i I think that we've all had to really evaluate what's not only just important in our lives and our identities, there was no where to go other than to stay at home and figure mm-hmm. out your shit if you got the opportunity yeah. to do so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I do want to talk a little bit about how your current relationship structure works today with your current partners. Mm-hmm. Like how did you yeah. how did you come to the understandings that you all have together? It was through a lot. <laughs> I bet. So I was in a relationship. And then had been kind of seeing a Mm non-binary friend. And, you know, my main partner was like, oh, cool, go explore, have fun. And then he kind of had somebody, but that was it. It was just those two people and then us. And then he said, hey, actually, let's open our relationship more. I really want to date this one person. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, oh, okay, we can try that. And there had been a guy, five, that had been interested in me. But I said, no, my relationship's not that open. And then I said, oh, we can now date. Mm -hmm. So we did. And I fell in love with him Mm -hmm. and ended the other relationship because that one was not healthy. And I realized that through being with five, I'm like, oh, like it's not normal for someone to get mad over the tiniest thing all the time. Mm. Uh, And then five was married and he and his wife, I mean, he still is, had started, you know, their polyamorous journey. I think last summer. Mm. So it's been not super long, but, uh, and his wife had a partner mm-hmm. and I decided to sell my house and we're trying to figure out what to do. And we're thinking, oh, well, I could move in with them. Mm-hmm. So we all sat down and asked, well, how do we want that to look? Mm-hmm. And he was saying, oh, well, I, you know, I could go from her bed to your bed, you know, just alternate each night or we could all sleep in the same bed. And I'm thinking, that's what I want. Mm-hmm. I want the same bed. And I was like, well, you know, what do I want my relationship to look like with his wife, Ronnie? Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, well, you know, she's she's smart and pretty and a cool person and, you know, has all these energy work things that she's done. And I could learn so much from her. Mm-hmm. I was thinking, well, we could try dating and just be like a thruple. Mm-hmm. But the chemistry between her and I just isn't as strong. Mm-hmm. And so we've, we're in this like weird middle ground. So she's yeah. like kind of my partner and kind of my metamorph. Got it. So kind of like you're yeah. trying to find the structure of the polycule. Yeah. And, and I hear also, and no judgment in this, I, I work with lots of folks with an ethical non-monogamy. You have to start somewhere. So I, I'm hearing that everybody's uh-huh. kind of like new baby polycule learners. Yeah. So yeah. So how has it been to manage conflict when you're new to this? It's definitely been challenging. And I mean, we 
talk well with each other. Like there's never yelling or anything mean or anything like that, but it's definitely been trying to figure out everyone's needs Mm. because originally Ronnie and five had said, Oh, Hey, we're basically best friends who sleep together. And they had talked about how Ronnie's relationship with her other partner that she has is super, super strong and connected and they're super compatible And then they're just like, oh, yeah, you and five are just super connected and everything like that. And so I kind of pictured it mostly be me and five and then Ronnie and her other partner, who she only gets to see every couple of weeks. And then it turned out that they're actually a lot more connected and they need each other more than I thought. I think maybe more than they thought. Mm -hmm. And so that was a little bit of a challenge because I wasn't expecting that as much. And then it was harder that the relationship between me and Ronnie didn't necessarily get as close and then five really wanted that relationship too because he's like these are two women i love and if they love each other like oh man that'd be amazing the difference between like what we hope for expect and then reality right like in in, it all it sounds like it all showed up all at once definitely but it sounds like you're navigating it like i that's that's what something i want to like tap into because I, I've worked with many a, a newbie poly human and I think that there's uh-huh. there has to be some tolerance of big emotions as they come talk yes, about talk about definitely. that a little bit for yourself <sighs> it's <laughs> okay. been hard and one of the things that was really hard is because I used to be very very depressed years ago Mm -hmm. and I did a lot of work to pull myself out of that just tons of self-care and you know eating right and just everything and I found myself getting really depressed but I was also going through a breakup selling my house moving into a new household and all of this it was just so much but I got really down and then I was judging myself because I was thinking I'm doing all of the things I did to get out of depression before. Why am I still depressed? And so Mm. that was hard to try to have grace for myself because I was beating myself up for feeling sad, which just made it worse. Yeah. I I hear all of the transitions you're describing. And I think until the feelings come, we are not prepared for how they might look. So Uh does your self-care maybe look a little different knowing that maybe depression may come or go is is your self-care a little different now that you are essentially living in a polycule not really which is probably something I should look at and see if there's anything to change but it does feel like I'm starting to come out of it as some of the stressors are lessening yes the the ends of the transitions have started to happen Mm -hmm. and that absolutely can lighten the load a bit I think yeah. kind of back to what we were talking about COVID, that reevaluation of what actually self-care looks like in any environment mm-hmm. is something that we've all had to start to navigate through. And you're yeah. in a whole new environment and a whole yeah. new relationship structure that probably will change a couple more times as you go. And that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you said that when you were doing the self-care before, like what were, what were some of those elements that really helped you before with depression? Do you think? So I started what was called or is called the miracle morning. And I'm trying to say Hal Elrod. I can't remember who coined it, but it was a person who had depression issues and looked at all these different morning routines that people did Mm -hmm. to just start their day off. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, savers. So it stands for, silence or meditation, Mm -hmm. affirmations, visualization, exercise, reading, and then scribing. Mm -hmm. And so I just started doing all of that every morning Mm -hmm. and then also being careful about what I ate and eating healthy and just making sure to take good care of myself. And that really helped. Mm -hmm. And then also being really mindful about my self-talk and making sure it was positive. Mm -hmm. Fair. I can definitely hear, having worked with quite a few folks who've been through a lot of depression. I've been through depression myself, like recognizing what a routine is and what you need and Mm -hmm. is, is not always easy to do because depression is like uh, the way I describe it to other people is like a, an entire body and brain fog. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is being in bed all the time. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes for some people, it's more, looks more like agitation 
or irritability and not understanding Mm. why, because you hadn't existed that way before. And so I can hear you using a routine to really help you take a step back and see what, see how and what you needed. And Mm -hmm. that, that's a big part of depression treatment is trying to understand, knock down a routine to the bare bones of it and then trying to replicate it as much as you can. Yeah. And I, I wonder how do all of you in the household talk about either your mental health struggles or sexual health struggles? We try to be fairly open about it. And we've realized that all of us talking together is way more helpful. But for a while, mm-hmm. Ronnie would talk to five and then five would try to relate that to yeah. me. And it would sometimes come out wrong and then vice versa. Mm-hmm. And so eventually he was like, I... No, we all have to discuss together. And so that has been helpful. But we just try to be really open and vulnerable. And it was very scary at first, but it's gotten easier the more we've done it. Yeah. Asking asking to stop the telephone game is it's yeah. not it like we're all familiar with the telephone game, but we don't understand when we're facing big, scary emotions, how and why it's existing maybe between people, whether it's in a romantic relationships or even between friendships or coworkers. But mm-hmm. facing another person and preparing yourself for an intimate conversation is never easy. But I'm Her- glad to hear that you all are trying to navigate it the best you can. Would you say yeah. getting easier or harder? It's definitely getting easier. And one of the things that Five and I noticed was Ronnie, because she's been through yoga training and energy work and all these different things, sometimes she will be kind of in this different headspace and she'll help teenagers and a lot of like her teenage relatives come talk with her and she'll give guidance Mm -hmm. and help them in this sort of way and she would almost come off as this very enlightened guru like here's how we can look at this instead instead of just listening and being like oh man that sucks or oh I'm hearing you say that like I'm sorry and I'm here for you because it felt like she was trying to fix us Mm -hmm. in a way and it was her form of helping but we talk to her about it and we're like, we just need you to be like a friend and a partner and not like the enlightened guru. And she was like, Oh yeah, I'll work on that. And it's been so much easier to talk to her now mm-hmm. about that stuff because now she just listens and reassures. Yeah. Okay. So I'm hearing you all learn how to give each other feedback too. Yeah. I, I, I'm fantastic. I, I, again, like this is going to be the learning process and how it looks today. It'll look different in a year it'll look different probably in three yeah. weeks so yeah uh would you say like wh- how i i mean i think this might be helpful to to some folks do you have any like people that you like to follow or books or even youtube channels that really help to kind of inform how to begin a poly or a any kind of ethical non-monogamy relationship yeah i watched i think it's Brittany and connor mm on youtube i'm trying to think of any off the top of my head specifically about polyamory besides them and nothing's really coming to mind and just i like watching a lot of self-development people and i think that can be helpful too just to work on yourself Mm -hmm. as well so i love mel robbins i watch some tony robbins stuff Mm -hmm. marissa peer Mm -hmm. a little bit more hardcore but i really like tom bilyeu and his wife lisa bilyeu Mm -hmm. at impact theory Mm -hmm. And relationship theory is one that's helpful that they do. Yeah, I always encourage people to check out The Ethical Slut. So anybody who's listening, yeah. it is a wonderful book and it's a great place to begin. Yeah, One of the, I have had various uh, people who once they have been in either like a polycule or poly relationships for long periods of time, they when another partner comes in, they will like hand them a stack of books and say, okay, yeah. <laughs> here, you're yep. going to start here. And if you're into this, then we'll talk <laughs> because yeah. It, it is, yeah, I really like, it's difficult to tolerate all of the feelings and how the dynamics change all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I really liked more than two and poly secure as well for poly books. Yeah. And uh, finding people that you can see that are doing it in the most healthy way and y'all 
therapy is always an option. <laughs> those, of, yeah. those of us, I, I, there are many, me, myself, and colleagues that have helped walk people through the beginnings of their poly life or understanding ethical non-monogamy for them. So it, yeah, mm. go to therapy, y'all. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we have a therapist. So I'm, I'm glad to hear it. So all right, how do folks find you in the world? So Kira Joel on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Kira Joel Zero on TikTok, and then KiraJoel.com is my website. Awesome. Thank you for being willing to share and open up the doors to your life. We, I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me.